Firstly, thank you. Uh, I think to, to SCI and the, and the British Carbon Group, it's, uh, it, it's an enormous honour to, to, to receive uh, this award. I, I think it's always uh, lovely to receive awards that you haven't applied for. Uh, it, it's really a much, much nicer thing to happen. Uh, and this was an enormous surprise. But uh, I know it might sound slightly cheesy, but this is really uh, dedicated to the team back at concert uh, and also, in, uh, as I said, my talk to Trinity College Dublin and Ireland as well, um, who are really the, the geniuses behind this and, and um, bringing together uh, the science and the technology uh, into commercial transition and, and tech transfer into, into a commercial environment. Uh, and they've done a magical job on this. Uh, all I do is, is shout at them and make sure they're heading vaguely in the right direction. So uh, thank you very much for a, a really very special award, and, and we, will, we will enjoy it back up in concert a, a great deal. So thank you. Right, um, I'll bring this up. Right, uh, so uh, what I'm going to try and share with you tonight is, is a little bit of the story uh, and, and how we got to uh, our graphene product at the end of it. And, it's, uh, and um, I thought I'd put together a quick overview, and you have to pay attention here, but this is what I'm actually going to cover in the talk. So I'm going to talk about how this man, uh, some of that, uh, one of those, uh, a little bit of that, a lot of that, <laughs> A fair amount of that got this to look like that to enable some of that. So that's the overview. Um, and uh, it, it all starts uh, up here. This is our site up in the, the northeast of England in Concert, uh, a little bit south of, of Newcastle, about uh, 40, uh, 20, 40 minutes south of Newcastle. And um, it's an extraordinary picture of this because it's mostly green. And those of you who remember concepts from your uh, geography case studies and the collapse of the steel industry there uh, will know that uh, you know in the 70s and 80s, concept was a complete uh, moonscape, and, and literally it was just dust. And I remember going to visit uh, the factory when I was a small boy and, and thinking, gosh, this looks like a pretty ghastly area. Um, it has gone through the most extraordinary trans transition, not an easy one, uh, but it is now uh, a recovering town is principally becoming a dormitory town, uh, and we are holding on as hard as we can to keep uh, manufacturing. Uh, a good point for me, uh, manufacturing. There, I grew up with the argument around dinner being: uh, you only create value in one of three ways: you dig it out of the ground, mineral extraction; you grow it, agriculture; or you make it. And even manufacturing requires those first two, and that's something I've been I've been bred on. So this is our site up in Constant now, um, and we are a 28 million turnover business. We employ about 173 people, uh, and we've been going since 1926, and we are a, a very diverse business now. We, we manufacture a lot of different things, um, but it's a, it's a great business to be able to run. I joined it in 2006, and uh, I always say it's, it's just big enough um, to scare me out of bed every morning, but just small enough to be able to manage, and I think that's a, a nice little balance. So here are the family mug shots. Uh, I mentioned, I'd say, how this man, top left, is my great-grandfather, Tommy Swan. Uh, he founded the company, and I think it's worth pausing for a minute and just thinking about founders, because uh, I'm extremely lucky. I've, I've made the decision to join a family business and uh, steer it in the direction to which I, I think it ought to go and to have fun with that. Uh, I, I kind of shied away from starting up a company in my own, in my own right, uh, because I realized just how difficult that is, and the statistics uh, um, uh, support that. So I made the conscious decision to join a business and, and change it, whereas my great-grandfather was driving a steamroller, uh, literally packing down the slag from the steelmaking process in concert. And he suddenly thought, well, we should be able to take this, uh, uh, this waste product and turn it into something. So he mixed it with tar at the end of the hoodie pattern, and made tar macadam, so he made black top. And he made and laid roads all over the northeast, down, uh, down to England, and even at one stage got through Spain and down to Morocco. Uh, and a lovely little story there, which was then we got some money stuck in Morocco, and we could never get it out. Uh, so my father took my mother there on honeymoon and spent it. <laughs> <laughs> 
So anyway, uh, he was the founder, and uh, then we moved on to mining our own stone, and we started mining um, uh, good quality stone, because of course the slag wasn't particularly good quality, so we had to get the quality up even though it was cheap. And we moved over to bitumen instead of tar, and then our very first chemical product was a cation that's a surfactant uh, that helps uh, tar um, stick, to, sorry, bitumen stick to wet roadstone, and that was how we got into the chemical industry. Needless to say, it helped by my grandfather top right there, Robert Douglas Swan, who married into an American chemical family and got hold of the recipe for that, so we did quite well there too. <laughs> then my, grand, uh, my father took over, Tom Swan, who is currently my chairman as well, and uh, he is still 100% owner of the business, so we remain a 100% family business, uh, which is quite rare. Uh, and I took over um, the, manif- uh, the, the managing of the company in 2006, but it is still 100% owned by Dad. So. Uh, my dad's actually took two bottles of wine and a, um, a rather large hangover and a pay cut uh, to join, so uh, he managed to get the end somehow. So uh, briefly, because uh, we want to talk about graphene, uh, we, are, we have this very diverse uh, core chemical business. We manufacture additives in the tire industry, powder-coated curing agents, uh, biocides that go into leather processing, household care biocides. Uh, you may recognize that bottle, but we, we sell uh, the active ingredient in, in brand decal disinfectant and also um, hand soaps uh, as in the States as well. Um, resins, polyamide resins that go into printing inks, uh, and then that pot is meant to signify our custom manufacturing division where we use our kit to make other people's products for them. And then, of course, advanced materials, which is signified by the graphene at the bottom. So a very diverse business, uh, which has helped us enormously through the, through the uh, years, especially in the recession, because it gave us lots of things we could rely on. But also as a company, we have this um, uh, continual habit of getting bored and going off and doing something that looks interesting. And this is principally my father's fault. Uh, and he, he uh, um, delegated responsibility for running the business before I took it over to someone else, uh, and I think he literally just started twiddling his thumbs and bringing a new scientist. And so over the years, we've started up companies using the core chemical business as the, as the sort of cash generator, and we've uh, had various successes here, um, usually done with universities, so Thomas Long Scientific Equipment, that was a spin-out from Cambridge University Engineering Department, um, MOCVD reactors, we, we worked out how to deploy very thin layers of gallium arsenide, gallium nitride, uh, and then that sold to HCOM very, very well, a, a very big success there. And we gave one of the bits of kit to Cambridge University afterwards, so thank you, about a million pounds worth of kit. So there is a lab named after us in, in Cambridge now, the Thomas Long Lab, because of that. Uh, needless to say, that actually led to us developing carbon nanotubes, because to say thank you, they had a lunch, his dad came down to lunch. Uh, and sat next to Professor Windle and said, what do you do so I make buckyballs? And said, so, well, can you make nanotubes? And that's a different story, not tonight. But, uh, bioprocessing, um, uh, separation of protein around uh, um, glass beads uh, with antibodies, a uh, reason why Millipore still has a, a manufacturing unit in concert. Screen technology, uh, protocols for flat screen displays, small screens which you can then put over large areas, a fantastic failure, uh, so we, we lost our money on that one and then biodynamics research, contract pharmaceutical assessment. So very diverse stuff. And then more recently, which we still own, Cambridge Photonics, the protocol for switching optical uh, uh, fiber optic light down fiber optics, uh, and, and we've had some very big successes there in, in patent settlements recently. And then one of my first investments into Cellar Energy, which was a spin-out from the SDFC, Science and Technology Distributions Council at Rutherford Appleton Laboratory. Incredible protocol for, for hydrogen storage and material carbon storage. Again, another story. But what that gives us is this platform for innovation and, and this e- excitement and interest about trying to create new technologies, get them out of the universities and into companies. Um, but we also try and approach innovation across the whole business, and that's why we came up with this uh, definition, which is innovation for us is any idea, not just on the commercial side, no matter how small or large, that adds value to the company. Uh, because it's really important people internally understand they've got to innovate as well. Just improving a process helps add value to the company. It's also, obviously, externally about that connection between seeing a market need and then finding a technological solution to it. And that's where it's so exciting that SCI is moving back into that space of helping companies find the links to those scientists. Um, so that's what we think innovation is. Uh, but this platform I've mentioned, a uh, platform for innovation, is this spoiling situation I have, which is a big reason why we could get into graphene and get into carbon nanotubes which is we have uh, a stable company. We ha- do have a stable company now. We managed to get through the recession and stabilize it. Um, so I've got the cash to be able to have some fun with some, some new ideas and also the time to, to be able to do it. But there are a couple of other things that are really important in that process that we spend a lot of time and effort doing. Uh, just having the opportunity flow and seeing new ideas, uh, and I know Neil's here tonight, um, from, uh, comes, comes from industry, 
one of my favourite magazines. I should, I should swap it out for New Times, actually. But sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, seeing those ideas uh, come across and, and seeing who's working on what is one of the biggest um, opportunity flows that we use uh, just from reading magazines. The academic collaboration, I always said, is, is a really important thing. We work with most of the universities in the UK uh, at some point uh, because we need to go to these centres of excellence because we're a small company. We can't go out uh, and develop our own research on, on all the fields that we're interested in. And a slightly cheeky uh, um, uh, pointing there to networking. I know you're all very thirsty, so I'll try and get a move on here. But... Uh, it is important to sit down and talk. Um, drop the email. Go and see people. Go and talk to them because that's where the really interesting stuff happens. Uh, and it's also quite nice. Uh, the other thing it allows me to do is be very patient. We all hear nowadays, uh, you know, terror stories of, of VC funding and, uh, and, and how it doesn't give time for, for new ideas to come to, to market. Uh, here's a classic example of this. This is our common nanotube timeline. I wrote this in a presentation in 2004 thinking that we'd have commercial applications by 2010 or 11. We still haven't got there yet, and we're still holding on to it just. Um, we're quite excited by the fact that Fujitsu has announced that it is going to take forward carbon-based, that carbon nanotube-based memory and licensing chip, and one of our customers in the States is developing this. So we're getting there slowly on that, but it allows us to be patient, to, to give time for new technologies to develop. So very briefly, we all know that one of the challenges of innovation is, is getting from a new idea to profit. And the only reason I've thrown this slide up, which uh, has lots of sort of the challenges doing that, is the fact that we ask for help. And it's so important to ask for help. And we've been helped by all these organizations. And I've constantly got on the bottom right hand here that we've worked with Innovate UK because they've been so supportive and helpful to us. Uh, and getting those ideas from that first bit of research in the university level, uh, successfully out to market and then actually making money, is an enormously big challenge, a huge challenge. Even though we're a stable company and we have cash flow, it's still a big challenge. And that's why all of these companies, all of these organizations um, uh, have helped us in one way or another. There's a, sorry, we're going to automatically. I just want to also touch very briefly on failure, because I think failure is also an enormously important part of the innovation process. Uh, and I've got a, a little video here that demonstrates that absolutely perfectly by uh, uh, Mr. Dyson. As we all know, uh, and uh, I'll let it play, and then I'll talk about how failure has affected us as a company, uh, and how luckily we haven't so far failed with graphene, but we have had failures, which I think shaped how we approach things. There's a myth about there's a myth about inventors that all you need is one good idea and you'll make your fortune, but um, the fact of the matter is, you don't have ideas like that. Well, you start with a problem that you're having to solve and you start building prototypes, hundreds of them, perhaps even thousands of them. And very often, the original idea or the original problem um, doesn't look anything like the final solution. So the important thing is this journey from prototype to prototype. And during that process, of course, you get hundreds or thousands of failures. And the failure is the starting point, because when something fails, you understand why it fails, and then you start to think of ideas as to, as to ways you can overcome that failure. I mean, the cyclones for my vacuum cleaner took over 5,000 prototypes. That's 5,000 failures before I'd cracked it. So the moral of the tale is keep on failing. It works. So uh, we try our hardest to fail as well. Uh, and there are good examples of that, which I mentioned, the, the flat screen display um, side of things as well. But Supercritical is a good example of a failure we've made uh, where we developed with Nottingham University and Professor Polikov uh, a fascinating process for, for supercritical CO2, putting CO2 down to massive pressure at the as liquid and solvent at the same time. Again, I'm not going to go into this because we want to talk about graphene. Um, but the point is it didn't work because um, um, the, the government didn't legislate to get rid of volatile organic solvents and also the whole process was slightly more expensive to, to run. So it didn't produce anything that was genuinely unique from that process. So eventually, commercially, sadly, it died. Uh, but we have had the knock-on effect from that, and it's something we talk about a lot in our company. Whereas you, if you have a go at something, even if it doesn't work, often it creates other discussions and other things happen, and it leads to new ideas and new processes. Um, so we've adapted our strategy because of this, and we've moved over to more of a 20% a technology push in our in our innovation, and 80% market-led innovation. And that again comes back to what SCI's message is here. As companies move more and more towards market-led innovation, it's so important that we have that support to then be able to solve those market needs by technological development. So that was a big fat failure. Anyway, graphene. 
which is what uh, I've been asked to talk about tonight. So I thought I'd, I'd go through the recipe for graphene, uh, and it involves some interesting steps which uh, kind of capture the journey that we've been through uh, and, and uh, we've just been talking about. And uh, the first step is Concord. Uh, I put this up because I was under the wings of Concord in the Duxford Air Museum. Uh, we'd sponsored a conference uh, at Cambridge University, and I bumped into Professor Johnny Coleman, uh, who was uh, uh, giving a talk at the presentation there, and there was uh, Johnny Coleman. And he gave a very good talk uh, at the conference I was at, uh, and he's a physicist. And I thought this was really interesting because graphene was starting to heat up at this stage. Lots of people were talking about it. And he was approaching it from a completely different way. He saw it as a physical problem rather than a chemical problem. And he gave a fascinating lecture, and I sort of thought about that for a while, and then I happened to bump into him underneath Concord. We had a bit of time on our hands, so we started talking. By the end of the conversation, I said, do you fancy us uh, sponsoring you for three years to develop a process for graphene? He said, yeah, all right then. <laughs> so uh, we started to work with Johnny, and it required, um, oh, sorry, a little bit of that. Uh, uh, it required a fair amount. In fact, that's not true. It required about that much of that. Uh, and um, then he took this after us paying many hundreds of thousands of pounds over a few years, uh, and he added um, that. He literally went out onto the high street and bought a blender. And he threw some graphite into it, which is what this is on the left-hand side, uh, a squidge of that, some water, and he got that out of it. Sounds wonderfully simple, doesn't it? Hundreds of thousands of pounds, a blender and some fairy liquid. Um, uh, I think we came out reasonably well out of it, but uh, anyway. Um, it is, of course, slightly more complex than that. And although he does talk about it in those terms, slightly tongue-in-cheek as I have, uh, we started looking at sonication initially. We realized that wasn't scalable. And the whole process uh, required um, quite careful tech transfer. We made sure that one of our scientists from concert was embedded with them over in Trinity College for the whole period of the, of the project. And that helped enormously, making sure that what they were developing was industrially relevant. And there, there's no point being able to make two grams of something that's absolutely fabulous. Because then people do the research and they say, great, can we have a couple of tons? But, well, you know, that'll take us a few years. Uh, it's always got to be industrially relevant right at the beginning, and that's what the process is that they've developed, uh, which I'll talk about now. But the other thing about uh, developing this process is that um, the tech transfer from Trinity then into concert uh, is, of course, an enormously sensitive and difficult thing to get right, because we knew that we could use this uh, mechanical process to break graphite down into graphene, similar to the sellotape that originally found it for the Nobel Prize winners at Manchester. All you're doing is trying to strip the, the layers of, of graphene out of the graphite, as it were. Uh, so we knew we could do it, but we had to develop a process that was then taking that, if you like, blender, kitchen blender process, and ha then having an industrially relevant process that could replicate that and produce good quality graphene. And uh, this is where I talk about Innovate UK, because um, part of, uh, I think, the importance of what Innovate UK does and the government grant process, uh, and bearing in mind I do sit on the board of it, so I, I declare an interest there, although it's never helped us get grants, so I must uh, also declare that. Um, it gives you time, and that's why I've got here somewhere, time. It gives you time to develop the process, time to get to market. Uh, a few years ago, if I'd gone to the, the board and said we're going to lose half a million quid this year on graphene development, they would have kind of gone, well, that's a bit much. Um, can we not cut that back a bit? Because of the grant funding, I could go to them and say, we're going to lose about £150,000 on this. And they go, OK, that's fine. Carry on. Gives us another year. We can then go to market, develop the commercial um, connections, and start to sell the product. And that's enormously beneficial for us, um, certainly as an SME. It allows connectivity within the supply chain, a critical point. So when I first started selling carbon nanotubes to the company, I thought, oh, this could go into composites. So I can get, you know, I'll go and talk to some ski companies and some fishing rod companies because I wouldn't mind a sweet couple of freebies of those. And I went to them and they said, well, that's interesting, but go and talk to the people who make our composites. And so I went to them and they said, well, go and talk to the people who make the prepregs and the resin. So I went to them and they said, well, go and talk to, well, I ended up talking to myself. And, and the problem is that you get this supply chain structure and if you don't get all the dots lined up and you get everyone in that supply chain working, trying to get a disruptive technology into an end application, it just won't work. And a big part of what Innovate UK funding does is get all those bits together, all those um, individuals, whether they be academics or uh, individual companies, together to work on a problem. Uh, and it opens doors as well, uh, and sometimes for SMEs like us into bigger companies that we couldn't get into. Obviously, the grant funding helps, as I've discussed. 
Often, if you've got an Innovate UK grant, and I've now got um, data for this, you are more likely to go and get uh, successful uh, uh, fundraising as you go out into the market to, to raise a uh, couple of funds. You're more likely to receive more money if you have a UK Innovate UK grant already, because it shows there's been an element of, uh, of, of uh, due diligence, if you like, already. And then from a process development point of view, we've worked very closely with CPI, Centre for Process Innovation, which is part of one of the uh, high value manufacturing catapults up in the northeast. And they have helped us understand how to separate the, the graphene. So we knew we could make it. How are you now going to separate it? There's no point having a suit that you can't sell. So we wor worked out one of the ways of doing that was using a cross flow filtration device. But they're really expensive. So uh, how are we going to make sure that it actually works before we buy it? Catapult. Exactly what they're there for. So we worked with um, CPI. They had one of these. They had the expertise how to use it. And they could then share that with us before we um, uh, committed to the price of these, this thing. Showed that it works, taught us how to use it. We can then uh, justify spending a lot of money on that device, which is now installed, to be able to separate our graphene as it comes up the process. So a huge point in ways of supporting companies in process development, and a good example of how that, that innovative stuff that works. And that ends uh, in, in a product coming to market, which is really exciting. So. So a little bit about that process. What does a kitchen blender look like? Uh, it obviously isn't a kitchen blender. We call it a direct liquid exfoliation process. Uh, and this is what we developed with Amber and the Tennis College Dublin team. Uh, and effectively, it is uh, high, high shear mixing. It's as simple as that. Uh, but it's making sure that it's done in a continuous process on a line that goes round and round and round, so you're constantly making the material that you need. It's scalable. That's the key thing that's highlighted at the top there, which is we know that we can now make about 20 tons of products a year. That's our capacity. So I think it's probably uh, world class. I don't think there are many companies in the world that could manufacture 20 tons of high purity graphene on a continuous basis and know that it's the same quality today as it would be in six months' time. And that's really important for industrial development because people who are doing industrial science need to know that if it worked yesterday, they come back so they can have a few more tons of this, it's got to be the same quality material. Now, in reality, Trinity College Dublin just did this high shear separation step. That was the kitchen blender bit. What we've added as a company is everything after that, and that's the processing step with uh, CPI and understanding how to separate things. So we have separation, we have washing units, polishing, and then product testing to make sure we understand what we're making. Now, for a long time, this is quite a dry slide, uh, and the guys going out and develop, uh, talking about graphene, this is all we could talk about because we hadn't patent, the patent hadn't got through, hadn't been uh, um, sort of uh, put in place, as it were. Um, this is a little bit of a, a world exclusive for you all because uh, that's a picture of the plant. It's the first time we've ever published it and shown it to anyone. And this is our graphene uh, direct liquid exfoliation process up in one of our labs. Uh, I'm not going to go, sorry, one of our production uh, units. I'm not going to go into the details of it because I've already expressed that, but the fact is, it's real. It does exist. So um, for a long time, we didn't even take customers around this because we were very sensitive about it. Uh, but it is there. It's been developed with a lot of Horizon 2020 funding and also Innovate UK funding. Uh, and for that, we are enormously grateful because it does help SMEs like us get these products to market. Uh, but it's a success story. A lot of people often say, what's happened to graphene? There's this huge, great, big sort of furore about it and, uh, and Nobel Prizes, and then it kind of died off. And hasn't anyone commercialized it yet? Well, quietly, things happen in the background. It's not necessarily all about patenting. It's about getting on and doing something that actually works and then getting a product to market. Uh, and that's what we've been working on. So as I said, we're up to 20 times a year on this. And really excitingly, we've already got over 200 customers compared to our carbon management business, which is still um, low digits. So this is a very different product, a very different amount of material, and, uh, and we think it's got huge potential uh, in the market. So a key thing about this is you've got to make sure that the graphene is in a usable form, and when it comes off the production line, it's a dry powder. This looks like soot, actually. Nice sort of grey soot. Uh, and so one of the things we're doing is making sure that we deliver it in a usable form. This is dispersed in epoxy, but we also add it to all sorts of other resins and solvents and, uh, and plastics as well from a master batch perspective to make sure that downstream customers can actually meet it into their, uh, into their process. So that's something we focused on as well. Oh, sorry. So a little bit about applications, uh, hopefully in the time we've got left. Uh, and I, I've just given a, a, a rough indication of some of the applications that we're selling into. Um, flexible displays, uh, transparent displays, some very interesting work going on there. Um, I can't really go into the companies that are doing all this, but I can talk to you uh, about the technologies. Uh, 
composites. Very, very interesting, very exciting work. So some of the resin work that we did initially by putting graphene into 1% loading into resins, we saw uh, between 20 and 25% increase in youngest modulus and strength, which is really exciting because uh, you obviously want it to be more stiff, but you don't want it to break, which is the, which is the, uh, the strength side of things. So we got reasonably excited about that, but lots of people have seen those results. The results we got back very recently is what happens if you then put that resin into a composite, so inject it uh, into a carbon fiber composite. And what's really exciting, this is only about a week old, this data, we've seen a similar increase in the strength and youngest modulus of the composite, which is pretty new, and no one really has reported that yet. So we've seen, again, 20 to 25 percent increase in youngest modulus and also strength of the composite which theoretically, if, if this is then proven by other people, will start to show that you'll be able to have lighter, stronger composites by adding graphene to the resin that you're putting into the carbon fiber composite. And that starts to become really interesting and very exciting because lightweighting in the composites industry and into aerospace and automotive is a key driver at the moment from a national perspective. A lot of work going into that. So we're pretty excited by that. And we've easily got the, the capability to scale production of graphene to be able to meet that demand, which is pretty exciting stuff. Uh, some interesting work going into sensors, uh, which is sort of quite close to this because um, what you see here, it's a pretty terrible picture, I'm afraid, because we have kind of had to take a picture of it because it's too big to be able to bring down to, to London, I'm afraid. But this is uh, printable uh, electronics. So what they're doing here is producing a graphene ink and then uh, printing it across paper. Uh, and it allows you to be able to, to do some very intricate uh, um, designs that allow you to then use that for sensors. And graphene then works as a sensor as well by being able to separate certain things and the electrical conductivity of it means that it, it gives you a message when you're capturing certain things across it uh, as a molecular sieve, as it were. So some very interesting co-work going on there. And all also being able to then be able to um, print uh, um, conductive uh, circuits onto things like um, uh, pharmaceutical packets. So you know when you've broken it, it sends a little message to your mobile phone and, and, and you know that that person's taken that pill. So some very interesting work going on there as well. This is really interesting. Uh, we've got permission to talk, to talk about this today uh, from the people we're working on with it. It's uh, a resistive heater. Uh, and actually, this is uh, there's now a, a better version of this that's come out. By putting graphene into an ink and then printing it on the surface and putting a current across it, it gets warm. And one of the exciting things about this is that you can imagine a whole load of wallpaper which has got graphene printed onto it. Putting a current across it, you get warmth from the wall from electricity, which is about 40 to 60% more efficient than convection heating. So this is radiated heating, effectively. Very, very interesting area to, 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 to watch. Uh, the volumes are great, which we're really pleased about. Uh, uh, but it uh, could be the future of heating homes efficiently from, electric, uh, from electricity rather than from, from open fires and things like that. So very diverse range of, of applications, which we're really excited about. They are coming thick and fast. Where we're at at the moment is very much in commercial R&D. So a lot of people are buying some small quantities, kilogram quantities, to be able to test their processes and ideas. And what that creates is that lag effect. So the interest looks as if it goes away again. And then you'll see in a couple of years' time, hopefully, those commercial applications starting to go through to full, full volume production. Uh, I talked about the composite. This is just to show a fracture, a fracture um, uh, surface of nanocomposite. So these are the graphene flakes embedded within the resin. Uh, and those are the results we got. Strength, 22% increase uh, compared to the, the, the um, straight resin and a, a strength increase of 25% as well. So some pretty exciting data coming out of that. Just to end, on a final note, uh, while graphene is really interesting, we're not only just interested in graphene. The same bit of kit, our posh kitchen blender, can also be used to make other 2D materials. And one of the ones we've launched recently is 2D boron nitride. Uh, graphene's black. 2D boron nitride is white, very interesting from an additive perspective because you don't get the, the, the black effect on, on uh, resins and plastics and things like that. Uh, and also, boron nitride, when you shave it off into its 2D um, version, is an incredible thermal conductor, but an electrical insulator. So that opens up all sorts of options about heat sinks and being able to get heat away from electronics and things like that. So there's some really interesting. We think that boron nitride could be bigger than graphene. Um, so it's quite interesting. If you look at people talking about graphene, they're saying, oh, it's very exciting. Well, actually, they should be also talking about other 2D materials. And you're starting to see that uh, language creep into to where we're going. So that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, and uh, it's a success story. It's something that hopefully you'll see greater success over the coming, coming months and years. Thank you.
Harry, that was a fascinating uh, talk there. Very interesting about how, uh, how the challenge is also taking for its market. Um, we are running quite tight on time, but I'm going to just allow one or two questions because I suspect there are going to be some in the room. So maybe just two questions, one over here, Neil. Uh, Tom? Uh, Tom? Yeah, thanks. Harry, that's, that's wonderful. <coughs> Looks like you're doing it the hard way because it seems to me that uh, you know if you had a, if you had a customer that said we need this problem to be fixed and the answer was mm. a graphene material, mm. you know, it's so much easier to, to commercialise something. But you, what you've got is a very interesting material. Yeah. You're out there looking for someone to jump on it. Is that yeah. is that right? Yeah. So that was uh, that was my comment about 20% tech push and 80% market-led innovation. So we used to, as a company, we've had a long history of being almost 90% tech push because we just get excited by stuff. Uh, one of the things I've tried to introduce since I took over was balancing that a little bit more by saying, let's still get excited by things because sometimes when we made the decision to go into graphene under the wings of Concord, um, it was, there was no market. It was purely just something that looked interesting and that's tech push and that's tough. It's high risk, uh, but the rewards can be huge. Uh, the alternative to that is where we're also now putting 80% of our efforts, which is market led innovation, where you go to customers and customers saying what you want, you reverse that up to then uh, the tech transfer, you know, the te uh, tech development, as it were, universities in the house, whatever it is, uh, which is far safer because, of course, you've got a guaranteed market when you develop that. So we're trying to get that balance right. Thank you. One more question over there in the corner. In one of your earlier slides, you put up, you showed graphene and boron nitride, yep. and I was very interested to hear the development of boron nitride, but on that slide you also showed molybdenum sulfide. Yes. You haven't mentioned that at all. No. Is there a reason? <laughs> did I leave that on there? Uh, you did that earlier on as well, didn't you? <laughs> uh, yes, it is. That's, so it's a good point, though, and it, we are being fairly open about it. Um, so the license we have with Trinity College Dublin is for 2D materials, it's not just for graphene, because that process of exfoliation is relevant to that, that whole family of 2D materials. So I think we have a license to develop about 15 different 2D materials. Um, molybdenum disulfide is the one after boron nitride, and we're just starting trials on that at the moment. Um, so there are some interesting uh, applications coming for that, which it, it's pretty early days at the moment, but we've got this lovely pipeline of being able to drop new 2D materials out probably once a year at the moment, uh, depending on market demand. So it's an exciting time ahead. Oh, one more, only because it's you, Tony. Um, it shows uh, a way forward of making products rather than, you know, chemists like us making processes. Um, it was announced recently from Manchester that you could purify water using sheets of, of graphene. And for those of us in process industries who use semi permeable membranes, which are usually used to purify water, and then I know how sensitive and difficult they are to use, whereas graphene, with its strength, looks a far better bet. Do you think that will commercialise? And supplementary to that, we're interested in how you take water away from products and what's left. Do you think that technology could be used to purify chemical products? Yeah, so, so thanks, Ray. I, I think there's a couple of points there. First of all, um, we, the graphene we make is, is only about a micron diameter flake in, in both directions, as you said, Amir, and, and then it's typically uh, a couple of layers thick, so it's not actually perfect graphene. You can leave it in the process and you can get down to perfect graphene, but what's interesting is the feedback from industry that we get is they don't, they don't really care about that. They tend to want slightly posh graphite, effectively. So um, it, it's a case of making what the demand is, which comes back to, to Neil's point. You know, we're now starting to see demand for certain areas. So I think the, the osmosis or the, or the capability to filter at that sort of level is going to be more about trying to produce very, very pristine sheets of graphene at larger scale, and that's not something we can, we can do. Uh, lots of other groups are looking at that, trying to be able to deposit uh, graphene onto, onto copper surfaces to be able to peel off perfect tech. Not something we're going to do because it's just not scalable. Um, uh, so to slightly avoid your question, uh, we are just a merchant supplier. Uh, we, we don't develop applications. We, we do what we, our job is to be a very consistent supplier of the raw material, possibly moving slightly downstream into inks or, or base composites or resins that you can then supply into industry. 
Um, but certainly the science around that so sounds very sound, but it's not something we've looked at. Thank you. Okay, I think we probably need to leave it there. I'm sure you can ask us some more questions to Harry um, over a few drinks uh, in a few minutes. Um, I just want to say it's great to see that um, commercialization happening in the UK and uh, congratulations again on the award. And can we just say a nice uh, round of thank you to you.